All right, thanks, Mauro. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some work on uh, tidally modulated grounding line migration. Uh, I should mention this is work based on a paper that uh, Hilmar Goodmanson and I uh, recently uh, submitted to Journal of Glaciology and which is in press. So you can uh, hopefully within a couple weeks uh, download this paper. Um, so perhaps I don't really need to motivate why I'm looking at uh, grounding line uh, migration over a tidal cycle, but just for a brief um, motivation. Uh, in order to understand the future of ice sheets, uh, in particular marine-based ice sheets, uh, we really need to understand the mechanics uh, near the grounding line. Um, and so here's just a simple schematic of an ice sheet going into an ice shelf and the grounding line over here. Um, and we want to understand the mechanics near this grounding line. Um, there's some theoretical work that goes back, um, back to Wertman and um, also to the paper that Christian Schuf published in 2007 that suggests that the ice flux um, is um, intimately related to uh, the grounding line ice thickness. Um, and more, uh, maybe more importantly, the uh, ice stability, ice sheet stability, um, is controlled by uh, mechanics at the grounding line. Um, this is even more um, noticeable in some recent work that I've done, which has um, also been submitted to a Journal of Glaciology, um, where we find that um, it's, it's really this near grounding line uh, zone where the frictional properties at the base are, are important. Um, and so we want to understand this zone better. And um, here's just some additional motivation in terms of uh, grounding line instability. Probably all of you know all of these papers, so I'm not going to dwell on this, but there have been a bunch of recent papers about uh, grounding line instability and how it relates to, um, say, bed slopes near the, uh, near the uh, grounding line. Um, and so for why are we looking at tidal mod modulation? Well, tidal modulation is basically a natural experiment to, that tells you um, something interesting about the grounding line. Um, in particular, we have this forcing over a tidal cycle where, where when the tide goes up and down um, and uh, the, the grounding line migrates back and forth. And um, so if we have this natural experiment, then potentially we, we can um, understand more about the grounding line by, by studying this mechanical problem. Um, and so in this presentation, I'm basically going to try to answer just two fairly simple questions. Uh, the first is the primary, which is just how far does the grounding, mi grounding line migrate over a tidal cycle? So it's a fairly simple, straightforward question. And then secondly, uh, what does this imply about ice sheet stability? Does it give us information about um, things, uh, for example, bed slopes or, or things that, that relate to ice sheet stability? Um, and I should also mention that there's been a lot of previous work done on a related topic, uh, which is ice sheet flexure, um, or ice shelf flexure, I should say, um, going back quite a long way. So Holdsworth in 1969, um, Niels Rhee, uh, 78 and, and 03, uh, David Vaughn in 95, Walker et al., 2013, and Syag and Worcester in 2011 and 2013 who have all looked at this problem of uh, ice shelf flexure. Um, but I'm claiming here that um, at least some of this work is difficult to apply to this question of how grounding lines migrate. Um, one, one of the reasons for this is that all of this work is based, all of this previous work is based on beam theory, um, which is an approximation to the elastic deformation that occurs uh, um, in tidal flexure. Um, and then furthermore, uh, most of these papers actually assumed a fixed grounding line, so they can't, or so they don't really address this problem of how far the grounding line migrates. So the, the first five papers that I've listed here all assume a fixed grounding line. Um, and just as one example of how um, this results in unrealistic uh, predictions, if you have a fixed grounding line um, in this model uh, from uh, Walker et al., uh, you have this uh, basically this fulcrum point at the grounding line where they uh, mandate that, you, that the grounding line cannot move. And because of that mandate, um, they, they predict uh, very large stresses at that fulcrum point. Um, if you think about um, there uh, being like a lever with a fulcrum, um, you need to have very large stresses at that point. And um, we think that the, um, this interface, this uh, say either bedrock ice interface or till, it, till ice interface, 
um, cannot be strong enough to uh, withstand that, that amount of stress. Um, and so we think that's a, um, a somewhat unrealistic prediction. Um, and then even this, this work of, uh, this recent work of Sayag and Worcester, in which they allow for grounding line migration, uh, we think there's a, a few things that are, are, are slightly unrealistic about that. For example, this important one that um, they don't really have an equilibrium position from which they do their calculations. Um, and so um, that's one improvement that um, we've, we've looked at. So now to get into what we actually do, um, here's a sort of schematic for, uh, for, the, uh, for the problem of interest to us. And so what we've done is looked at a, a fracture mechanics problem um, where you can think about the ice shelf forming a crack that, um, with the ocean underneath. So there's a crack underneath um, the ice shelf um, and the tip of that crack is at the grounding line. Um, at least initially. And um, we're going to solve an elastic uh, problem. Um, so we're going to say as the tide goes up and down, there's elastic deformation of this, of this ice sheet, ice shelf uh, system. Um, and that um, there's, uh, it, yeah, it, uh, it responds to this forcing from the tide. Um, so in the schematic, uh, we have this original um, crack, but in an elastic model, um, if you have uh, uh, at an equilibrium position, you're not going to have opening of a crack in an elastic model. So to account for this um, fact that you have long-term viscous deformation that accommodates this nice uh, cavity underneath the ice shelf um, over, over, uh, over equilibrium state, we assume that the elastic deformation has zero, uh, zero displacement in this equilibrium state um, and that we're looking for uh, uh, elastic displacements on top of that. Um, and so we, we have an, uh, an ice sheet, ice shelf with a th certain thickness, and then we apply, uh, we apply uh, elastic loads to that and, and determine how far this, this grounding line moves. Um, to show you what the schematic looks like sort of in the, in the deformed state, um, so when you have, have a tidal loading um, from equilibrium, um, then you're going to have some migration of the grounding line in response to this tidal loading. Um, and in the model schematic domain, um, it looks like this, where our original crack or our original ocean uh, cavity um, was of length L0, um, and then it, it um, increases by a certain amount, delta L, uh, due to the loading that we apply. Um, and I should mention that the loading that we apply is hydrostatic uh, uh, water loading. So it's basically how much additional um, pressure due to how much additional water pressure you have due to the tide going up and down. Um, and in this region where the grounding line uh, migrates, there's a, a, a different expression for this, uh, for this extra pressure um, that has to do with a factor that I call gamma here, which is related to how much additional um, water height or equivalent water pressure do you increase by inc uh, changing the grounding line position. Um, and then we can basically solve this. Uh, so just a little bit about how we solve it um, with this excess hydrostatic pressure and this factor gamma, which relates to how much additional water height you get for a given grounding line um, uh, position migration. Um, you can then input that into this model where uh, at, the, at the bed where you uh, have this crack, we assume that there's a zero frac fracture toughness, uh, meaning it's quite easy to open a crack. Um, we think that this is uh, appropriate because fracture toughnesses that have been observed or measured for ice have been, are quite small. Um, and we expect that the bedrock interface or the till uh, ice interface would be even weaker than that. Um, we assume homogeneous elasticity um, for simplicity, so this is just a, um, a model. Of course, this could be improved in the future. Um, and then the grounding line position is determined by solving for um, what's, what the position that would be that's consistent with uh, the deformations and pressures that are applied along the crack face. So um, when we do that, um, first, before going into uh, the sort of elastic flexure that we get. Um, there's a, an important point that I wanted to stress, which is that even in the hydrostatic case, um, where 
you don't have flexure, or, or in other words, where the flexure is uh, uh, as flexible as, pos as you need it to be so that you have a completely hydrostatic situation. Um, you, can, you can solve for the amount of grounding line migration in this case, and it depends on the surface slope, it depends on the bed slope, um, and uh, you, can, you can solve for how much it migrates, how the, how the grounding line migrates over um, the tidal cycle, both from equilibrium to high tide and from equilibrium to low tide. Um, and if you just perform this calculation, you find something which is maybe a little surprising, which is that um, there's a very asymmetric migration. So the, this gamma factor, which tells you how much the, well, uh, for a given um, uh, tidal load, how much the grounding line migrates, so that would be the inverse of gamma, um, is very different for the going to high tide situation compared to going to low tide situation. And in fact, uh, it's a simple scalar multiple, so um, this is about nine times uh, larger than this number for the same uh, surface slopes and same bed slopes. Um, and so this implies that there's an extremely asymmetric uh, uh, grounding line migration over the tidal cycle. Um, if you just put in some numbers, like a tidal height of, or tidal perturbation of two meters, um, uh, surface and bed slopes of 10 to the minus 3, then you predict that there's two kilometers of uh, grounding line migration from equilibrium to high tide, but only 0.2 kilometers of grounding line migration from equilibrium to low tide. So I think this is something that has not been um, recognized previously. Um, now we can go to the, to the uh, flexural case and see how that is modified compared to this hydrostatic case. Um, and here's just an example of the type of uh, displacement and pressure profiles that we, we get in this situation. So this is just plotting in, in the blue here is displacement as a function of position along, uh, along the ice cavity um, or the water cavity. Um, and then the green is the pressure distribution here. Um, and here I've just uh, s set the end of the ice shelf at zero and the original grounding line was at, at uh, minus 10 on this scale. Um, and so you can see this, in this particular case, we solve for grounding line position um, at this position minus about 13 point something. Um, yes, and uh, so it's, it's minus 13.7, I guess, compared to what would have been calculated from the hydrostatic uh, calculation, which is minus 12, meaning a two kilometer grounding line migration uh, from the original grounding line, which was at minus 10. Um, and so you see that in this flexural case, uh, for a specific choice of elastic parameters, um, which is in the realistic range, uh, we get an extra 1.7 uh, kilometers of grounding line migration. Um, and you can see what the, um, there's also an associated pressure profile uh, related to that, um, which is um, uh, maybe what you might expect. There's a, an increase in the pressure as you get to the original grounding line, and then from that point, the pressure uh, de this excess pressure decreases um, as you get to um, as you get to the new grounding line position. Uh, but one maybe very important point is that you get to negative excess pressures in this zone very close to the new grounding line, uh, which means you have uh, water pressures that are less than hydrostatic ice pressure um, at these points near the new grounding line position. Um, and then you can do a, um, a study of how, how, the, how this uh, migration depends on different parameters. So um, here's a plot of just how the grounding line migration depends on this forcing factor. So this forcing is, is the ratio of the, uh, of the observed, or the, yeah, the tidal amplitude divided by this gamma factor. Um, and the, the green line here is just the hydrostatic prediction. Um, that you, f you predict that the grounding line migration is linearly related to the forcing. Um, but when we do this numerical experiment with the flexure, we find that it's not linear. So in fact, you get a, uh, a much larger uh, grounding line migration for a s smaller forcing compared to, um, compared to the larger one. Um, so it's, it's a nonlinear uh, relationship. Um, and then finally, you can see how it depends on ice sheet thickness, for example. Um, and you see that uh, uh, it, it has a different uh, prediction compared to the hydrostatic, and it's also different than, than the beam theory predictions.
Um, so uh, you can compare it to, uh, you can compare it, I guess I'm running out of time, but uh, you can compare it to observations, and I'm just going to rush through this briefly, but um, there have been previous observations of, of um, this migration, and you, can, and you can get new estimates for um, what the bed slopes are. So just in conclusion, um, we find that grounding line migration is asymmetric. Um, it migrates upstream of the hydrostatic point. Um, it's a nonlinear uh, calculation, um, and you get different predictions than beam theory, and you can re get uh, predictions of bed slopes uh, from this analysis. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe a quick question while we switch over. Yeah, so we account for the bending moments and, and the thickness. Yeah. So it's a fully elastic calculation. 